Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. Now these Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&As are questions and answers from the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle. And the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle is a closed Facebook group that people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint get access to and they can ask their training questions and I answer them in these Q&As. And the Deer Dog Training Blueprint is a 12 part, 15 hour, month by month video series with everything you need to train your own Deer Dog. We basically film the entire training of a Deer Dog from start to finish, from picking it up as an 8 week old pup right through to a fully trained Deer Indicating Dog or a Big Game Indicating Dog shooting Deer over it in the bush and it's all in there. You can find out more about that at Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram and Facebook or on biggameindicatingdogs.com and there's links to videos and trailers and tons of info on that. Now these Q&As have evolved quite a bit over the last couple of months. Um, we started doing them live and I was actually calling people up and talking to people on the phone during the Q&As. Uh, just slurping my coffee there, if you can hear that on the audio. Um, and that went alright, but it was a little bit messy, sort of all over the place. Um, we were getting into these longer calls and spending lots of time on one question and sort of it was, it, we were having issues with calling and it was sort of breaking them up a bit. And then I did a few just off comments. I'd put a... Um, I'd put a post up a couple of days before we were going to hold a, Q, a live Q&A and people would ask questions. Um, some people would put comments on that post and I'd say put Q&A in two days, put comments on that post uh, if you can't make it. Otherwise, we'll see you there and I'll answer your questions live. And then we got to the point where I was like, well, why don't I just put a post up? As soon as I've done one q and I put a post up then everyone's got a couple of weeks to put all their questions on that and then I can just answer those questions and as soon as I've done this q and I'll put a new post up, people can ask the questions on that and now I've got all the questions all in one place, I've sort of sk skimmed over them a couple of times and I'm going to sit here, so this isn't live and I can just go over these questions um, properly without having to do calls or read comments or break the whole Q&A up and once this is up, I'll put another post up and we'll do it like that. And that way we don't have to do them live. You guys don't have to turn up to answer questions and maybe the Q&A sessions can flow a little bit better too. Um, it means I don't have to do them at a set time, so it's probably going to be easier for me to do more. And I think they'll probably be better as well. And this is all just stuff that we work out over time and... All the stuff just gets better and better. So I'm going to rip into it. We've got quite a few comments here. Just double checking I'm recording. I'm pretty sure I'm recording. I'm recording. I'm, I'm double up. We've got backups upon backups here. Right, so Matt Short's first question is, what are your thoughts on getting a dog fixed? In your opinion, is there an effect on prey drive, etc.? I didn't want to get mine neutered before he turned one year old, but now that he has passed the one year mark, I'm considering getting him fixed. Um, Al says he's thinking the same thing. Um, said, I was thinking the same thing with Chester. I had him fixed as I'm not interested in breeding him at about 14 months. He's good as gold. I'll do it again. Um, Ryan Hart said, try listening to previous Q&As because we have covered this before. Again, we've covered it in great detail too. Um, there, there's just loads of different uh, comments and views on it there. Um, yeah, look, all my dogs are fixed. Um, Print, Fly and Miko are all fixed. I got Print fixed... Um, when I got Miko, 
because I didn't know when Miko was going to come on heat and then I was going to have, you know, a, an entire, a, an unfixed bitch here with Prince trying to get into her and Prince in the past has been pretty good at sneaking in quick there um, on that one. So, yeah, I got Prince fixed and then just to deal with that so I didn't have to think about that and then I thought about it and... I was, then I was waiting for Miko to come into heat, and she wouldn't come into heat. She she turned out she was going to have her first heat quite late. Um, and I was waiting to get their first one out of the way. Then I'd have six to 12 months of, of um, not having to worry about it, and she just wouldn't come in, wouldn't come in. And then I was coming up to a real busy time where I was, I was going to want to have to um, get away and put her in the kennels and go away. But then the kennels don't want them when they're in heat. Um, at least... Most all the kennels I've talked to don't want a bitch in heat anyway, because uh, it can just be a nightmare with with unfixed male dogs and stuff like that, and they can whine and bark, and it's just a it can be a real hassle. So, long story short, I just thought stuff it. I'm getting all my dogs fixed. I don't have to think about it, and um, you know it hasn't made much of a diff- it hasn't made any difference to print, and and this is this is the take on it that I've given in. Um, other videos, I made a video ages ago that I put on Facebook um, where I said, look, people will tell you don't get them fixed because it's going to affect your dog's drive badly. Vets will tell you you have to get them fixed because it can prevent health health problems that they might have later on if you don't get them fixed. Um, other people will tell you definitely get all your dogs fixed for some reasons and other people will say definitely don't get your dog fixed for other reasons. My take on it is just do what you want to do. There's no solid reason, you know, that's a definite solid reason that it's definitely going to happen every time um, that it's going to pan out. You know, if you're going to get your dog fixed because it's going to calm it down, you might get your dog fixed and it'll make absolutely no difference at all. Uh, Or, you know, uh, uh, someone else might be telling you definitely get your dog fixed because it might prevent a health problem later on or it might prevent this or that it probably won't either you know and, and again it just comes back do what you want to do and it's probably not going to have a massive dramatic effect either way if you don't want to get your dog fixed for any reason don't get it fixed but you're just going to have to be aware that if it's a bitch and you don't want it to have pups while it's in heat you're going to have three or four weeks of uh, mucking around um, managing that while it's on heat. If there's another dog around or the kennels probably won't have her or you know, the neighborhood dog's going to be sniffing around and stuff like that. Um, and obviously if you get a, a dog fixed, then you're not going to have, it's not going to be able to have pups. But, and, and actually I was thinking about this question um, just as I was getting ready to, to do this Q&A. And that's probably a, a one that I haven't covered off very um, much before is um you know people having people saying oh i just want to get a litter of pups out of my dog or out of my bitch on my dog or i think if my dog my male dog is you know mates with the female dog it'll just mature him and make him calm down or have some drastic effect on him and people say the same about pups uh, about bitches too that um Oh, if I just want to get her in pup and get a litter out of her to calm her down or and you, you hear other people too you know like they have a dog that they've put quite a bit of effort in and it's turned out okay, um, you know, whether it's a bitch or a dog, and they're like, man, I just want to get a litter of pups out of her, you know, and then they're not a they're not a breeder, they're not a um they're not an extreme, you know, dog owner, uh, you know, dog owner or trainer, or they're just a, an ordinary person who just wanted a dog, so they got a dog and they liked it, and they get this idea that I just really want to get a litter of pups out of this dog. Um you know, and look, my take on that because you know I've I've had some great dogs. I own some great dogs, and and um, I've even been in situations where I can breed, I can breed them and get pups and stuff like that. But I always come back to there's a lot of dogs out there. There's a lot of pups and dogs out there. There's a lot of litters. There's a lot of really good breeders. There's a lot of really good breeders that that's all they do. All they do, and some of them have spent generations doing it and have spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars importing 
um, different dogs and semen and um, with kenneling and set up and staff and breeding and, and testing and all the stuff to try and breed the ultimate pups. And there's people out there that do that with labs and GSPs and um, there's a lot of there's a, a lot of really good heading dogs in New Zealand. Um, that's all that's all they do. The specialists at it. And I just think, why well, am I'm a trainer and a hunter? Why am I? Why am I going to do it? Why Why do I need to get a litter of pups out of one of my dogs? Yeah, they're good, and they could probably make good, really good pups. But there's plenty out there. If I ever want to get a good pup there's more than enough to choose from you know so um that's my take on it um, i don't think it reduces drive i've seen a lot of really good dogs that have been fixed um there's no massive dramatic reason to do it there's no massive massive dramatic reason to not do it um just do what you want to do man and and if you're thinking about having pups think about do you really need to do it do you really need to do it Uh, lackey, I think. I think. I hope I'm saying that right. I've got a border terrier. He is going really well apart from one thing. I'm struggling to get on top of his barking. He's not constantly barking, but he barks at things he is unsure about in his free time. I'm putting a lot of pressure on him verbally and leaning in, etc. But it seems to be not working. What would you recommend? I'm just skimming over a couple of comments below here. I've got a border terrier and he's going really well. Man, we need as much context and details on these questions. Hey, I've got no idea how old that dog is. I've got no idea um, how much training you've done with it or the situation. He's barking in his free top, you know what I mean? There's not a hell of a lot of context there. Um... Pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want, man, and eliminate the situation as much as you can. You're saying, I'm struggling to get on top of it, barking in his free time. Um, and again, I'm totally guessing because I've got very little details or context on this question. He barks at things he's unsure of in his free time. So it sounds like to me, maybe... He's out running around and you're not with him. He's on free time. He's on like a freedom session. Um, that, you know, that, it's, a, it's a real common one. If a dog's like barking at the neighbors over the fence or barking out front and patrolling around and making a real hassle of, of itself, it's um, in a situation that it's not ready for, you know. Um, but, I, yeah, I'm going to skim past that one. Give us more context on it. Um, and I'll cover it again in the next one. Um, it's just guessing, trying to answer that and go into it off, yeah. How old the dog is, are you with it? What's well, a couple of the comments here? And you, everyone's doing a really good job of answering people's questions in the comments here. We've got over 300 people and the big game indicating dogs in a circle all following the same training system and and it's been really good um people are putting posts up asking questions and the answers are just bang on there's so many good answers um and so much good support in the big game indicating dogs in a circle um it's really good every time a post comes up i jump in and check and there's just a whole bunch of people saying what i would have said anyway um But yeah, Lackey, um, put pressure on it. Keep putting pressure on it. Eliminate the situation as much as possible. Try not to set your dog up to fail. Try to get it, keep it out of that situation where it's barking. And try to work with it in that situation and just move work through it step by step getting it better and better until it's 
knows what to do in that situation. Stop stop setting it up to fail, put it in a situation where it's barking um, and just work with it. But yeah, it'll be interesting to know how old your dog is, exactly what situation it's barking in. Are you with it or are you leaving it out and walking away and all that sort of stuff? Um, put it in the comments on the next Q&A post that I'll be posting as soon as this goes up. Matt Jones, my dog's four month old German Wayhead pointer. Training's going pretty well, except for every now and then while training, she has a big burst of energy and runs around flat out for 30 seconds to a minute, then settles down. But because I'm not always holding the long line, there's your problem. I can't check her because the burst comes out of nowhere. If, if your dog's doing something like that, you've got to hold the end of the long line. She's not ready for you to let go of that long line. Again, it's the same as the last thing. First thing you do, and this is in the blueprint too. First thing you do, anytime you run into a problem, you go back a step in training. So early on in training in the blueprint, we're always holding on to the long line because of this exact reason. If you don't do enough groundwork holding on to the long line, and then you start letting it go, stuff like this is going to happen. And then every time that happens, and you, if you let the long line go before your dog's ready for it, and it breaks out of range and runs around, and you're trying to give it commands and it's not listening and you're in that situation where it's all out of control, that's exposing weakness, which we talk about too, that's one of our principles. We're actually going to do revised principles in the Deer Dog Training Blueprint very shortly. But exposing weakness, that's exposing weakness, you know, and the whole blueprint system is set up so you basically never do that. You never put the dog in a situation where it has an opportunity to not listen to a command until it's all set up very, very well and, and solid and it's just a habit, you know. And you've got a lot of good control and that's why the whole thing is a is a 10 month long step by step process with a lot of little steps where we get the dog ready for the next one. We get the dog so ready for the next step before we take it that each step we take is easy and the dog basically does it automatically. And when you're running into big problems like this, with your, if you're putting the long line down, your dog's taken off, your dog wasn't ready for that next step. You know, and it's all in there. It's all in the blueprint. Uh, if anything, people complain that there's, if any complaint you can have about the blueprint, there's too much in there. But there's not. There's actually everything that needs to be in there, you know. Um, so I can't check it because the burst comes out of nowhere. Thoughts on whether I just let it go and she might grow out of it or try holding on to the long line all the time and catching it straight away. Holding on to the long line. I would try holding on to the long line all the time for now and catching it straight away. Also while training she will get into play mode and try biting my ankles and jumps around putting and putting pressure on doesn't work at all. Should I try ignore it and wait till she snaps out of it or just call it a day and go straight back to the truck? Once again, it's all it's only for a minute or so and then she's back on track. Thanks for what you're doing, mate. Loving it. Cheers, mate. Um Yeah, so that last thing, going into play mode and biting your ankles and jumping around and doing all that sort of stuff. Um Yeah, I wouldn't put up with that either, you know. And and this is why we train on a long line <clears throat> and this is why we do so much early on. If you to to really get a really well trained dog to a to a high level like we do in the deer dog training blueprint, you know you can't set them up to fail. We do a lot of long line work, you know, and and that long line allows us. We've got control of the dog the whole time, you know, and it's not about yanking it around and 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 bossing it around, but that long line's there so we can show the dog what we want it to do gently. We don't have to yell at the dog or put a, a stupid amount of pressure on the dog or anything, we can just use the long line. 
you know, anyone that's watched the blueprint can see that. Um, it's all very gentle. The dog can't get it wrong because of the long lines there and the techniques we use. And it's very important that you use a long line properly as well. You can use a long line completely incorrectly and, and have a nightmare with it. It can almost make things worse to a certain extent. Um, but it's very important that you use it, you know, and, and coming back to like the dog doing that whole run around burst of energy or the dog jumping up and bob at you and biting your ankles and all of that, that's what the long line's there for. If the dog starts biting your ankle, you go up and pull it away from your ankle with the long line. You know, sometimes I don't understand, and this is where where um, one-on-one sessions can be really important. Um, and, and we're talking about doing the um, group training clinics and things like that. But at the end of the day, you've really got to, um, you know, think about it yourself and look at what I'm doing in the blueprint. And oh, what I was about to say is, sometimes when someone says, oh, my dog's running around and I can't control it, or my dog's biting my ankles and I can't stop it, or my dog won't stay on the sit, it doesn't make sense to me because you've got a piece of string tied to that dog and you can control it. You've got 100% control of that dog. You know, in the case of that dog running around, that's why we have a leash. That's the whole idea. The long line's just a long lead <clears throat> that gives us a lot more room to work with. We can do a lot more with it. And the phrase, my dog just runs around out of control and I can't stop it, doesn't even make sense because you've that's what a long line's for or my dog won't stay on the sit it just gets up and follows me in the blueprint we show you how to tie a loop in your long line and peg your dog to the spot when we are increasing distraction on the stop you shouldn't have to do that and you don't want to have to do that you should be able to get your dog ready for that step to the point where it's easy for it when it gets there but if you do if you've done something wrong or you've exposed weakness in the past that's when and your dog's already got bad habits that's when something like using that peg can be useful but what I'm saying is you've got a hundred percent control of the dog a hundred percent um you know even a massive um strong dog and that's why we use a long line the way we use it because if you go to a big thick collar or harnesses, then the you've actually got to pull harder on the dog and 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 be firmer with it, and um, it's actually worse. The whole idea of the long line is everything's very gentle, you know. Um, so all of that stuff um, is is about being firmer with the dog. That type of um, jumping up and biting at your ankles and running around being silly. That's often a, a um, symptom of your dog getting bored during training. And maybe you're not moving enough, you're not in an interesting enough area, or you're repeating drills over and over, or you've done drills and your dog's good at it, and you're doing too many, and your dog really just wants to walk and cover ground. Dogs just love walking. You know, if if you do a whole heap of stop drills all in a 50 metre square and you're just going backwards and forwards or round and round in a small circle just doing stop drills over and over, the dog will get bloody sick of that and that's when they can start rebelling a little bit, jumping up at you, getting a bit anxious and it all gets a bit weird. That's when just walking, you know, and we, we, should, we do this in the blueprint, um, the, the walks are long through big spaces. You know, there's videos online of me walking around with print in a massive paddock. I'm doing huge, you know, like um, kilometer long loops. If you're in town, you know, you find the biggest sports ground in the town and walk right around the outside of it. Drive out of town on the weekend and take your dog. In New Zealand, we're so lucky with that. You can drive half an hour out of any town and get to a walkway or, or some area where you can take your dog for a good big walk. Um, I talk I talk about breaking the breaking drills up with time and space time and space so and, and and that's what a dog needs 
doing the drills over and over too close together without walking far enough in between or without having enough time in between is no good and they get sick of it and they start um, doing stuff like that. So, yeah, four month old. Still pretty young, but that, that would be another big idea for both of those problems, Matt, would be um, move more, man. Move more. Less drills, more walking. Less drills, more walking. Try to relax more, but be very consistent. I've seen that anxious, jumping, biting, wanting to burn, or, you know, run around in circles and all that. A lot of that can be anxiety based. And I've seen that in handlers where their training and handling and drills isn't necessarily perfect. Some of their timing's a little bit off or something's not quite right or they're just too intense. And they're like, just sit down, sit. And the, the handler's getting pissed off and you know uptight and anxious. And then that transfers over to the dog and then that manifests in that crazy nervous tension um, and the dog doing weird stuff like wanting to burn around and jump up and bite and do stuff like that whereas all of the drills in the blueprint it's all set up so you can remain super relaxed and that's what the long line's for and you just say you know with me print sit and i step on the long line walk step in and push his bum down and there's no i'm not yelling at him to do it and i'm super relaxed and if I'm relaxed and the dog's relaxed and everything works better. Okay, next question. And what's with the with the names in the in here today? Uh Radovan. Radovan. Hey mate, I'm picking up a GSP in two weeks from now and I've started watching the blueprint and would like to complete it before picking the pup up. That's a good move really good to watch the whole blueprint even before you pick your pup up then you know what you're doing you know what you're choosing a pup to do and oh, it's just a works really well although i'm only up to section five i have a question my wife my wife has a two-year-old my wife has two-year-old house pup that has very little training and my concern is that this two-year-old dog is going to be a bit of a bad influence on my GSP pup. What's some tips to avoid that? Thanks in advance. Jonathan Griff said, Hey bro, we've got two house dogs as well and they have had no influence on my GSP in any way. Redovan, Redovan has said, Thanks mate, that's reassuring. Stephen said, why not start your house pup on the blueprint? Give you some practice and it will benefit the whole family. This is a great point. His, um, if it's his partner's house pup, <laughs> uh, she might not um, be so much into that. But yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, and I kind of agree with Jonathan, Jonathan's answer. You know, it shouldn't really have too much effect on it. Um, if you stick to the blueprint with your pup, keep them pretty separate. But then you can use the house dog to the, your partner's dog to, um, uh, you know, socialize. Even if it is a bit crazy, do we, we show you? That's why I show you that in part one. I show you um, introducing fly to the pup um, to print um, with print on the long line when when print's really young, but fly's really well trained. So I'm telling fly to sit. And it's all controlled and structured. But it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be an issue, you know. And and um, I would just create a real separation. Um, and, and again, it's difficult to say because I don't know what your daily routine is. I don't know um, all the ins and outs. It's hard for me to really um, 
give any sort of step by step um, exactly what to do here because I don't know the exact situation but um, it shouldn't be a problem it doesn't have to be it's not like you can't follow the blueprint with another another dog in the house it's, it's not that way at all you know and um, actually the whole time I was raising and training print we had, I was doing deer dog boot camps and we had tons of dogs coming and going and some of them were were, were pretty bad you know when they first turned up um, like Jonathan said um, it's just not an issue at all um, and if you just follow the blueprint and make sure your pup's doing all of that stuff and you're working through those steps and hitting all your markers then it's just it's just it shouldn't be an issue at all um, Jeff is Jeff saying hey mate when would you introduce your pup to a quad and Todd said he's got a seven month old GSP bitch that I've got set up real good now on a quad. I'm not an expert, but happy to share with you how I did it. Yeah, I mean, um, when would I introduce? When and how would I introduce my pup to a quad? Look, I just do, that's what we go over um, the non-avoidance training in the blueprint um, where print was a little bit um, print was a little bit funny about the truck he got sick in the truck the very first day I picked him up and brought him home and after that he wasn't like really bad but he wasn't really happy to come running over to the truck and just hop up in it either and then when it was running he was a little bit funny about it too and we go over that in the blueprint um, non-avoidance training I can't remember off the top of my head what part it's in, but we've got, it, it, you know, it's easy to scroll through and find it. Um, and we've got that post somewhere. I can even, I can put it in the inner circle where we've got all the parts broken down and you can see all the different, um, where everything is. But we, again, we go over it in the blueprint, but um, I wouldn't do that, do that until my pup's a little bit older. And, you know, like quads are a safety thing too. And, um, with, you know, with the pup or dog running next to the quad or sitting on the back and if it's not used to it, it's trying to jump off and stuff like that. But, um, you know, getting their legs stuck down between the bars and things like that. But um, That sort of stuff shouldn't be much of an issue with a pup or a dog that you've trained with the blueprint because your dog, or you can call your dog and it'll come to you. You can tell it to sit down and it'll stay there. So you've got all the, the different tools that you need to help guide your dog through a situation like that. And that's why we leave a few things to a little bit later on, like introduction to... Uh, gunfire and introduction to water and things um, so we've actually got that dialogue with the dog we, if the dog gets scared of something that wants to move away we can say sit down or call it back to us come here and it listens we've got those tools instead of trying to do it super early and introduce our dogs to things like that and guide it through those situations before we have any dialogue or control of it you know so um, I would tend to wait a little bit until you've got a bit of that till maybe the the pups I don't know and, and every pup or dog's different too you know it might be five or six months old it might be seven or eight months old for other pups or dogs but I would start off really early um, real early with a pup or dog just putting it up if you want to have it on the back of a quad um, putting it up on the back of the quad and just getting it comfortable up there and just patting it and making it a positive place without the quad running. And then I would introduce the pup uh, to the quad with the quad running and get it used to just being around the sound. And then getting it used to being sitting on the back of the quad with the quad running. And, and I'd just work through that step by step um, over weeks or months and just five, ten minutes here or there until the pup or dog's comfortable with it. And then I'd start, you know, um, slowly riding around in a nice, 
flat, easy area with the pup or dog on the back. Make it fun. Um, I'd follow those principles of putting pressure on what you don't want and praise on what you do want and remembering that rule that you don't want to reassure a dog when it's scared of something. If a pup or dog's unsure and it's a real common mistake, we've talked about this a lot, someone's pup or dog is showing fear or something and wanting to scurry away and they're going, it's okay, good girl, good girl. They're trying to reassure it, but what that's actually doing is praising it for being scared of the quad or whatever it's being scared of. So if a pup or dog um, shows that fear behavior, you actually go, ah, cut it out, sit down. You put pressure on them. You say, no, don't be scared. You don't have to. It's very counterintuitive. So cut it out. And then as, as soon as you see them relaxing, even just a little bit, this is correcting the thought or this is putting praise on the thought in this case. As soon as you see any sign of that dog relaxing after you've put pressure on it for being scared, you praise that. And you're saying, good dog, relax, relax. So that's why I like principles, because you always come back to it. Do I want my dog to show fear of the bike? No. So you put pressure on it, cut it out. And as soon as you see it starting to relax, you put praise on it. And if you follow these things properly, follow that principle of pressure and praise and and you wait till you've got a little bit of dialogue with the dog. So you've got a recall. You can say, come here, if it tries to run away when you start the quad up. Or you can say, sit and stay when you put it on the back. Then a lot of these things that tend to be very, very easy to work through. Um, very easy, you know. And um, a lot of the problems people have with silly things like their dog getting scared of water or their dog being scared of the truck or helicopters or the bike is merely a symptom of not having a proper dialogue with the dog and it's very very common that people do that putting praise on they're trying to reassure the dog while it's scared and the dog's taking that as being praised for being scared of the thing so um it just shouldn't be an issue man that's how i'll do it um, if you, and, and again the long line is very good for that <clears throat> I use the long line with print and we actually show you in the blueprint um, we film it all and I'm talking about it as it's happening print is trying to move away from the truck and I'm saying I'm saying, ah, come here, putting pressure on him don't try to move away and I pull him back in with the long line and as soon as he's with me I tell him to sit and he's with me right by the truck and as soon as he starts relaxing I give him a pat and I just don't don't give the dog an option to get out of it. That's the big thing, is that um, you don't let the dog get it wrong. You know, and that's where the long line comes in too. Um, that's actually a really good point going back to um, Matt Jones. And he was saying, um, he said about his dog running around and jumping up and biting him and stuff during training, biting his ankles and stuff like that. Should I just call it quits and put the dog back in the kennel? No, definitely not. And you never want to start something like with that when you're dealing with that issue um, or a dog being scared of the four-wheeler. You never want to end a session with the dog biting at your ankles and starting all that stuff and then going, oh, well, you win, let's go home. Then the dogs won. And and dogs just repeat whatever worked last time. You know, they really do. So And the dog will do that again next time when it's getting sick of you doing drills over and over in the same spot or doing whatever you're doing to piss the dog off. And it's the same as something like with the quad or people's dogs that are scared of water or helicopters or anything. Um, if the dog gets scared of it, try something to get out of it and it wins... It'll try it again next time. But if you go, ah, cut it out, come here, pull it in with a long line, put it back on the quad, wait till it relaxes, and then as soon as it relaxes a little bit, give it a pat, wait a while, let it off, then you've won, you know? So that's a, that's another really important idea there. And again, that's a principle, you know? Never, always end on a good note where you've made a tiny bit of progress. It doesn't matter if it's a tiny, tiny bit of progress, but you need to get that 
ball rolling in the right direction. Dave Singer. How's it going, Dave? I Dave has a one-year-old heading dog called Pip. Had her since she was eight weeks old. Started with the blueprint then. <clears throat> He's up to part five in the blueprint. She's going well with her command stops, non-communicative stops, turns. She's good in her kennel. Good at in and out of the back of the truck. If she's out of the kennel at home, she's good and sits around. We have 20 hectares. She works well on this. The problem I'm having is going to public places that have distractions, i.e. other dogs, people, etc. Also, if I'm out doing training and there is a hare or a quail, she tenses up and loses focus on whatever we're doing. She becomes 100% focused on any distractions. He's done avoidance training with dead hares, and she always gives it a wide berth. She has also always been distracted with vehicles going past on main roads. Right from about age four months old, she tenses up and focuses on the vehicles. I've taken it to a lot of parks and public places over the last few months. When we are doing a walk on a track that has had a lot of foot traffic on it, i.e. people, dogs, she does a lot of sniffing, still listening to the commands, but nose down all the time. Should I keep her nose off the ground? The more I check her with the long line or give her corrections, the worse she becomes more tense and flighty. It's as if she is trying to anticipate what we are going to do next. I really need some advice on how to handle these situations. Any help would be appreciated. Okay. Let's having a drink here, Dave. <clears throat> The main thing I can think on all of this stuff is um, correcting the thought, you know, and um, yeah, cor it's correcting the thought with things like the, um, you know, the hair or the other people and dogs and the, um, truck going past and all of that and we're actually going working with this in the um, Palmico dog guide at the moment with an with an older dog that's aggressive and and really fine tuning your reading and timing and so in this case this older dog is, is shows a lot of intensity and aggression towards other dogs and, and she'll see another dog 200 meters away and just start jumping and whining and pulling at the long line and everything just or pulling at the leash and everything just goes crazy. And but she didn't she pulled on the leash everywhere she went. She didn't have a proper stop. She didn't have a heel. She she didn't know how to walk properly on a leash with no distraction, you know. So so we've been working on all of that and getting and I'm talking about you can't deal with those things without dialogue with the dog, having a proper stop, turn and go and all of that sort of stuff. Um and Dave, you're saying you've got that, but something's off somewhere with your reading and timing or there's a handling issue somewhere um, for this not to be working right. And often, you know, I mean, and every dog's different. You know, you get some dogs that have a lot of intensity around certain things. Print has a lot of intensity with other dogs. Um, he's fine in a lot of situations. But when we're out on the beach or in the park or whatever, it's that's just the thing that he's doing out there is he's looking for other dogs. He'll stay in his range, he'll stay in at heel or whatever, but he's just a lot of intensity, like staring at the other dog and stalking up to it and all that sort of stuff. And it's it's a constant bit of a pain in the ass and just a habit of his. Um, and I just keep putting pressure on it, keep managing it as good as I can. And I, and I know it'll slowly calm down and he'll get better and better, but it may just be one of those annoying things that he always has, you know. Um, every dog's different. Every dog has their own little idiosyncrasies. But when I get him out in the bush, 
and there's no real distractions of other people and dogs and and there's deer in the environment and he's looking for them then that's the thing he's intense about and obsesses about and is looking for so so it's fine you know um but i just have this little annoying thing where where if i'm trying to walk him and stuff it, it's a bit, little bit of a pain in the ass so there's that side of it too you know that that don't expect too much so it, how much of a big deal is it is it really bad um is it going to be a real hassle once you're actually hunting how much of a problem is it you know there's that side of it too are you expecting too much and you're saying you're you're um correcting it and the more you correct it and check it it's almost like the more intense and worse the dog's getting and all of that do you just need to relax and not worry about it so much she's a she's you said she's a year old and you're only on part five you could be a lot further ahead than that um and you could be hunting soon you know what i mean and, and how much of an issue is it if you relax i've got range i've got to stop she's good around the gun she's showing interest in deer skin everything's pretty well set up maybe you should go shoot some deer you know um, so there's that side of it but then there's the other side of it of um getting your reading and timing right and making sure a dog isn't you know like in the case of this other dog this dog that gets really aggressive and we're doing a video on the palmico dog guide where we're showing people how to uh read the thought and correct the thought and the fact that before a dog starts lunging and barking and pulling and doing all these really you know they're like that's like de way down the road behaviors of showing that intensity and interest in their other dog and it all starts with from a dog just cruising along relaxed to looking you know and and their facial expressions change their ears prick up and point forward and the dog looks and you can correct that and and we're making a video and i'm showing the owner of that dog instead of he was trying to deal with it walking around the park or, or around the footpath or down the beach with all these distractions and other dogs coming in and just way too much going on and i sh I, I sat down with that dog in it's in a chair in a seat and i sat down with another dog when, when we actually had fly and i got him to bring fly closer to me and I watched that dog and you could see when it was just completely relaxed, mouth open, panting. And then I'd say, okay, bring fly a little bit closer. And as soon as it, the first sign is often from completely relaxed, mouth open, panting, ears relaxed. Their mouth closes and they look and their ears turn forward. And I was starting to correct that. And, and so I'd say, okay, bring Flo the dog would be relaxed. The dog's name is Bo. So Bo would be relaxed sitting in front of me. Panting, completely relaxed. And I'd say, okay, just come a step closer. And a step closer was Fly is all it would take. And her mouth would close. And she'd look. And her ears would go forward. And if I didn't correct that, her, so her mouth would close. She'd look at Fly and her ears would go forward. And if no one did anything, she'd slowly stand up and then she'd lean forward and she'd be into a whole barking and whining and everything would be in, intense. And it, and then it, was, it would snowball out of control. But to a dog, that first stopping to pan, turning and ears coming forward, she's telling me, I'm going to go this dog. I'm going to have a go here. And, and if you don't do anything... That's like basically her saying, I'm going to have a go at this dog and me going, okay, do it. You know? And and a lot of people are very, very common that their dog's giving them these subtle signs and to the dog, they're basically telling you they're going to do it and you not doing anything is like saying, okay, do it. And when you really start fine-tuning it and re reading that first switch, that very it, it seems subtle, but when you start watching it and you see it, when you see a dog going from completely relaxed, just looking around just in the moment, panting, mouth open, relaxed, ears relaxed, to f fixating on something, uh, 
it's a very obvious switch and you can correct that and you can say cut it out just relax cut it out and then give the dog time to relax and you actually see them go for people watching the video i'm, I'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it and i'll, I'll do the and you you better hear it too so the dog will be sitting there to go <sighs> just dead serious like that and it'll just switch and you can go cut it out put a bit of pressure on it hold that pressure on and the dog will go from intent to <sighs> and it'll just relax again it's a very obvious switch you can read that and correct that and instead of trying to deal with it in a situation where you're moving and doing all of these other things, if you get into a situation with a dog where something like that's happening over and over and over and it's got all these triggers and it's it's you're not quite it's turning into a problem, it can be good to to get it close to one of those distractions. So in your case, Dave, I'll go to a park with other people and dogs. Um, that's what we I was telling Brad to do with Bo. And just sit down somewhere where people and dogs are going to come past. Watch your dog for when it's relaxed. And you'll see it just panting, completely relaxed. And just pat it there. And as another person or dog approaches, correct it right on that switch. Right when it switches over. And just say, no, no. And you can turn it back towards you. And actually physically turn its head back around towards you. And, and when you see it switch and relax again, praise that. Pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. And the and reading and timing. Reading and timing and pressure and praise. And getting it bang on and fine tuning it and correcting the thought. And that's what you're doing. That's what that switch is. They're, they're completely relaxed, just like in the moment, chilling out, looking around. Who knows what a dog's thinking about when it's doing that. But you can see the moment when it goes oh another dog and it's intense and it switches and then it builds and escalates you can cut that off right at the pass so um let us know if that makes sense dave have a have a dabble with that taryn has a six month old heading dog doing really well up to part four just wondering about training him to slow his pace down. His range is going good, but he's just going quick now and again. Um, six months old, up to part four. All that's in part five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, um, and, it, and this is, we've had this conversation a few times and other Q&As. Um, you know, at part four with a six-month-old pup, we're really just trying to um, link actions with commands, um, teach the dog processes and steps and, and have it reacting to commands. So if it's a little bit quick here or there, it doesn't really matter. All of that fine tuning and smoothing out and slowing right down is all in those later parts. Um, so main quickest answer to that is a six month old pup that's on part four is going really well, but and his range is good, he's just going a bit quick here and there. Like when you give your release command, they sort of dart out to the end of their range and then slow down again. Wouldn't even worry about it. And I'll just watch your head, watch your head in the blueprint. Um, Justin, we've spoken about this before on the page, but I'm still having trouble getting Pip to slow down and monitor her range. I've been trying to get her to match the speed on walk, walking with no luck. I turn her all the time, catch her by surprise, but she just goes in front and doesn't slow down enough. She's 10 months old. Anything else, everything else is going great. Um, same thing, man. Maybe patience. Um, keeping the tension out of the long line. Work on your non-communicative stops. Non-communicative stops are huge for this. Um, you slowing down. You know, we, we go over this in the blueprint too. Um, Talking about dogs being a mirror that the rule of state transfer. Um, yeah. I'd be interested to know what part you're up to. Just goes in front and doesn't slow down enough. 
yeah, non-communicative turns, automatic stops, and, and again, think about what you're doing. Make sure you're not too intense, sort of watching her and moving too fast and marching forward and that just relax everything right down, even the way your feet touch the ground. You know, and I, sh- I show that in the blueprint with print and just walk quietly, super relaxed. Um, really take a good look at what you're doing too. Scott, hey mate, any ex- extra tips on ch- kennel training? Can I be letting him in and out too often? Toilet breaks. He's been awesome overnight so far. Just the arvo when I'm trying to separate play slash bonding time. Basically would like to know if there's any damage I can be doing. Any extra tips on kennel training? Can I be letting him in and out too often? Yeah, you can be. Just in the arvo when I'm trying to separate play bonding time, basically would like to know if there's any damage I could be doing. So on that, and with a lot of things, if you're letting your pup or dog out a lot and it's getting a bit of play play and bonding time and freedom and lots of toilet breaks and all that, all of that's good as long as sorry, I'm just reading another comment as long as all your training is going well you know, if, you're, if your pup's getting a lot of time out of the kennel and freedom sessions and things and all your training's right on the mark, you're fine but if your pup's getting a lot of time out of the kennel and lots of front and freedom, but training isn't going well and you're running into issues, then maybe you need to take a look at what you're doing and restrict freedom a little bit more, you know. And this has come up a lot in the inner circle. Uh, someone actually asked the question, and, and quite often people's answers are in their questions. And then your next comment down, Scott, is also, so you said, um... Any tips on kennel training? Can I be letting him out too often? Too much fun and freedom? Can I be doing any damage? Then Scott, also any tips whether to discipline whilst he's nipping or chewing is simply walking away the best option? Disapproval command? Disapproval command is only new. I'm not sure exactly what what you mean by that. Um... Just reading a few more comments here. Um, Same things. We sort of talked about it above. You can be doing damage by giving your pup too much fun and freedom. And, And this has come up in the inner circle quite a bit where... Um... And again, people's answers are often in their um, question. Someone said the other day, uh, Hi Paul, I'm just having a bit of trouble with my part, not really engaged in training sessions or having trouble with a stop drill, etc, etc. I have been giving him a lot of fun and freedom, a lot of time running around out of the kennel, just pretty much having free run of the house. Um, what Do you think that this could have an impact on my training sessions? And... and you know, the basic answer, I mean, the exact answer is yes. And I talk about this in part one of the blueprint, how important kenneling is. And the reason why it's so important is because of the way a pup or dog prioritizes activities. If a pup or dog has lots of time running around out of a kennel with other dogs and kids or even on its own, just having all sorts of fun on its own, when you come out and put a long line on it and tell it to sit down, and just want to walk around quietly in circles and run drills and things, that's not that much fun. Because it's been having a lot of other fun, That's stuff that's more fun than that, climbing over kids or tearing around in the backyard or doing whatever it wants. So putting a long line on it and going for a nice walk with you and a nice, what should be a fun training session, going for a big long walk on the long line and doing stop drills where it gets padded praise for doing the right thing and um, bonding and engagement from you and stops and goes and turns and later on skin work and scent work and 
um, gunfire training and, and introduction to bush and water and all this stuff should be fun for a pup or dog and the person doing it. But, it, and it is, if you kennel a pup or dog properly. But if your pup or dog has all this really high intensity running around of fun with other people and dogs and kids and yelling and screaming and tearing around and digging holes and chewing stuff up and doing what it wants when it wants, then a walk on the long line isn't as fun as that other stuff it's been doing. You know, and, and it's it's important that you have a bit of control and structure as you bring a pup up. You know, and, and I talk about this in the blueprint, and this can get really cheesy and corny and cliche here, but in, in the blueprint I talk about everyone has to make sacrifices and work hard now to be good at the things that they want to do in the future. You know what I mean? Um, you just have to do it. You have to put the work in now to have a better time later on if you just like YOLO and just get on the piss the whole time then life's going to suck again later on because you're going you're gonna to be broken and alcoholic you know what I mean and it's the same with a with a pup or dog um, it's all about having that control and structure early on over the first year Put your pup or dog in a kennel for a couple of hours so when you let it out and put the long line on it it's in, it's engaged with you because that's the funnest most fun it's had all morning if your pup's been sitting in the kennel for a couple of hours you come out let it out put a long line on it and go walking around out in the field and do stop and go drills and praise it and do skin work or whatever you're doing at the time then that's fun for the pup or dog and it's engaged in it and it's listening and then you come back and put it back in the kennel and it sits there thinking about it and you come back that afternoon and let it out again and go do it again. Then it's learning, it's engaged, it's engaged with you, it's bonding, it's it's you're going in the right direction. But if a pup or dog's just tearing around doing whatever it wants and climbing all over your kids or running around with other dogs or digging holes or doing all that crazy stuff, when you try to train it, it's not going to, it's probably going to be tired and disinterested, you know. And, but the thing is, is with that control and structure, you only got to do it over that first year. But when, when you do it, then now you've got a dog that's well trained. And it's got to stop going calm and it doesn't dig holes and it's, it, you can le leave it out of the kennel and it just lays around or it's just a normal dog. You've got a bloody well trained big game indicating dog that you can take hunting with you. Then it can come inside, it can do all of these things. Um, and now it can play with the kids and have freedom sessions and play with the other dogs and all of that. But all the, And it's, it's a year old now, so it's mature and it's got some brains and it's settling down. And it's only going to get better and better. But if it has all that fun and freedom early on, but which is making it not engaged in training so your training doesn't go right, then it's going to get all these bad habits, it's digging holes and then you end up in a situation where you have to put it in the kennel for the rest of its life. You know, and this is a, a and, and you can't take it hunting and it can't have fun and freedoms because it's got bad habits, you know. Um, and this is a thing I've talked about over and over, um, but that that's the important part to it. Um Any tips on whether to discipline, question mark, while he's nipping or chewing? Yes, discipline it. Don't let it do it. Command a disapproval. I'll show you in part two of the blueprint. Very, very important. Um, you know, and it, and it just is. It really is. Ryan, bit of a general question. As I'm yet to get a pup, I live on a small acreage <clears throat> where I have my own small herd of goats. I also live close to state forest that holds goats. Also small numbers of deer. When the time comes, do you think I'll be able to have my dog ignore my goats yet actively hunt feral ones in the bush? Yep, definitely. 
Um, also, do you think aversion training to my goats will negatively affect his hunt, his desire to hunt deer? No, it won't. Um, uh, I've seen professional goat hunters with like packs of goat hunting dogs that indicate and bail goats, bite them on the ass and all that sort of stuff um, with pet goats. You know, and they actually use the the pet goats at home. They teach their dogs to bail and bark at their pups to bail at the bark at the goat. You know, um, but the dog knows the difference between the goat chained up at home and the goats out in the bush. And having your dog not hunt the goats or not, you know, having your dog know to not go after the goats at home it won't affect the hunting deer out in the bush. <clears throat> Do all your skin work, follow the blueprint, go and shoot a deer in the bush and your dog will hunt deer in the bush. Um, don't let it hunt the goats at home and it won't hunt the goats at home, you know. It's just not an issue. It's not, I know pig hunters that have the most, you know, intense pig dogs find bale and hold and really hard dogs and they've got, you know, pig styes at home with pigs that they raise for meat and stuff. It's, it's really not an issue. Um... Redovan, Redovan, um, picked up my GSP pup yesterday and started kenneling her straight away and even slept through the night, but not without heaps of loud crying and moaning beforehand. Today again, much of the same. He's already got a letter in the mail from one of his neighbours saying he'll call the SPCA if it continues. The pup is nearly nine weeks old and don't want to start with the commander disapproval yet. What can I do? You can put a bit of pressure on a pup man when it's barking and whining in a kennel. You can say, hey, cut it out, bang on the kennel, stomp your foot. on. You know, if you're inside or on the standing outside on the deck and the pup's in a kennel a few metres away, you can come out and say, hey, no, bang your foot. No, let it know that you don't want it doing it. It's not, it's not a bad idea. You know, you don't want to go overboard with putting pressure on a pup or dog, but um, there's definitely nothing wrong with that snapping it out of it you're trying to help the pup out you're trying to tell it that hey you don't need to be um you don't need to bark and whine in your kennel you know you're trying to help it out scott said hang in there just been through much of the same try having a word with your neighbors explain the situation his, he's saying his gsp pup moaned after been putting back in a kennel for the first week now he's good as gold <clears throat> as long as he gets to him before he needs a toilet break. And that's the same thing. We've gone over this over and over and over. Um, the first week can be rough, man. And we've had a lot, a lot of people now message in, ask this question. Hey, pup's making noise in the kennel. Neighbors are moaning a bit. And it's the same thing over and over. Just hang in there. Um, work your way through it. First week can be rough. But then you're away. And you've got a pup or dog that's quite quiet in the kennel. For the rest of its life you know and it's really good and the other thing is over and over and over all those same people i say look just talk to the neighbor battle your way through it stick to your guns and it'll come right and let me know what happens let me know if it doesn't come right or let me know if it does and everyone comes back and says man that week sucked but my pup Pup's good in the kennel now, and you talk to them later, and they go, man, my dog's so good in a kennel, and it's so bloody good. No separation anxiety. I can tie that dog up or chain it up, put it in a kennel, put it in a crate, dog box, whatever, and walk away, and it's fine, and it's the one of the best things to have set up with a dog, and that's why we start there. Um, Paul. Two questions regarding transitioning off the long line with my nine-month-old why here pointer did some training last night and a couple of things happened he flushed a quail without intending to and went all excited for 20 to 40 seconds until i sat him down and he calmed down i'm concerned about having him off the long line with this reaction i would be too and i definitely wouldn't want to do my first session with a German wirehead pointer off the long line with the quail around. 
um, I'd want to do it. Yeah, I w- really would be. I'd want to do it out in like a a, mo- a clear sport, a mowing sports ground with no game in it. Um, while off the long line, he seemed to not listen to directional whistle, and I'm having to increase my level of disapproval to get him back on track. Just recently, I used a very small nick on my e collar. Okay. We don't use e-collars in the blueprint, but all right. To sharpen, I used a very small nick on the e-collar to sharpen his sit command up, and he is now very attentive. Any thoughts on how to fix the above without an e-collar? Um, yep, couple of things here. Um, it's only nine months old. And it's a male German wire hair pointer, so um, I I wouldn't be in any hurry to go off the long line. I I definitely try to you know German wire hair pointers have a lot of drive and a lot of drive towards birds. <clears throat> Having live quail in your training area, particularly when you're talking about transitioning off the long line, is just I'd be trying to avoid that like crazy. You know, so get in an area with no quail. So first off, um, again, it comes back to what I was talking about earlier. Any time you're trying to take another step in training and you're running into trouble, you slow down and take a step back and just do more work on the long line and get them relaxed, get away from those quail, do more work in a really low distraction environment. Without those quails there, calm everything down. <clears throat> you know, and and... Yeah, and that's it. And yeah, and, and it's all laid out here. While off the long line, he seemed to not listen to direction or whistle, and I'm having to increase my level of disapproval to get him back on track. So if I if I that happened to me with a dog, take a step back, straight back on the long line. I do another month or six weeks or two months cruising around the long line. And get them him a hundred percent ready for the next step before you take it. Um, and me personally, I mean, we don't. I don't use e collars to train a dog. <clears throat> I just don't. Um, then we don't use e collars in the blueprint at all. Um, and I'll, I'll never use them. Um, I've used them a little bit for um, retraining older dogs in boot camps that were real bad for barking in the kennels that were real bad. I've talked about this in other Q&As with a dog that had had a lot of stuff done wrong with it and it had really bad, deeply ingrained barking in a kennel. Um, E-collars can be good for stuff like that um, with a real light nick, um, but I don't do boot camps anymore and, and um, stuff like that. Um, interesting stuff happening around the world actually with E-collars at the moment. Um, I haven't been following it really closely, but... I think it was in the UK they're banning the sales of them and, and trying to rule them out and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes if it sort of spreads around the world and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm just not interested in them. Um, I don't, you don't have to use them. Um, so I'll just slow down a bit, man, and get away from those distractions and just keep working on it, be super consistent and um, come come back to us if that makes any sense but nine month old dog um, nothing wrong with slowing down for a couple of months and, and just working on it getting it more ready for the next step um, Paul two questions regarding oh hang on I was at a, yeah it's a double up there Eugene has a six-week-old Vizsla Cross doing all right apart from two things. When meeting new people, I try to get him to sit and he starts biting me. Doesn't try to bite any other time. He is always tugging on the long line. He is only up to week five of the blueprint. Yeah, okay. Can I bring forward checking non-communicative range technique 
I'm just going to read this again. I have a 16-week-old Vizsla Cross. He is doing all right apart from two things. When meeting new people, I try to get him to sit and he starts biting me. He is always tugging on the long line. He is only up to week five. Um, so 16 weeks, he's about four months old. Yeah, you can bring forward, you can get into change of direction for sure. And you can bring stuff forward like that in the blueprint. And that's a big reason why I say it's really good to watch ahead. A lot of people, uh, uh, you know, have asked questions. Oh, my dog's doing this or it's doing that. How do I fix that? And it's in the next part, you know, that the, they haven't watched yet. Um, I'd be pretty firm on that biting me. Um, when he's you're trying to get him to sit and stuff like that, I check him on the long line and be quite firm on it. Just hey, cut it out, sit. You know, check him on the long line, make him sit. Um, I'd be pr pretty firm on that sort of stuff. A lot of that sort of stuff comes down to your tone and the way you check the dog. It's not about pulling the dog's head off, you know, or or pull, you know hurting the dog. It's about your tone. You can say no, sit down and be really rough with the dog or push the dog down hard um, or, or slowly pull on the long line really, really hard, what you don't need to do when you could have just gone, hey, it's that sharpness, it's your tone, ah, cut it out in a, in, a, in a soft touch but fast and surprise the dog with the touch, you know, and be quick and sharp in your movements but not necessarily really hard with them. Um. But I'd be pretty sharp and firm on on that biting and stuff, and yep, no worries at all bringing that that non-communicative range forward. If you're seeing something in your handling and training, you're thinking, man, I reckon that'll work good here. Bring it forward for sure. Jody, hi. Any tips on keeping my pup under control when meeting other people and dogs? She's just over four months old. She has awesome responses to a command around my self partner and a few others, but as soon as another person or dog is around, um, she gets too excited and doesn't listen. I've been doing the command of disapproval, but in this situation, she goes deaf to it. Um, and there's quite a few replies here. People giving her um, advice and referring you to other Q&As and stuff like this. And yeah, this is something we've talked about a lot before. Um, I've even just talked about this in the same Q&A. Um, first thing first, Jody, would be with the four-month-old pup that you're trying to train and stuff is trying to train in a low distraction environment as often as possible, trying to eliminate the problem more than, you know, dealing with it, with, uh, with it happening over and over. Um and 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 then um Radovan is given the 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 right answer here and it's what i was talking about with Bo. um and he said we've talked about it in detail in another q a and it's um correcting the thought you know getting getting onto it as early as you can um a real good one there is um sometimes just doing a sit she's saying um, any tips getting my pup under control when meeting other people and dogs she's awesome response to her commands around myself and partner yeah that's really it four months old super young um, I try to avoid the situation as much as possible I would try to even you know situation like that avoid giving the pup or dog a command in that situation you know if you're at the park or the beach or wherever you are um Try not to do a stop drill with your pup or dog while another dog comes flying. And you can just say nothing. Have your pup or dog on the long line. And if another dog wants to come running in, just let it come running in and just stand there and do nothing. Um, you know, and just walk away. That's There's that idea. You, you don't have a problem until you give a command. And that's the beauty about having a pup or dog on a long line. And you holding the long line, you've got control of it. It can't go tearing off. Nothing terrible can happen. It can't break its range. Um, and you don't have a problem until you give a command, just walk away. 
you know, and, and I do a lot of that. Um, I'll sort of, a dog will come charging in and be climbing all over my pup and the owner comes walking over with a big smile on their face and um, uh, you know, they have no idea or understanding about the way I train dogs or what I want to do. And I actually had it just a couple of days ago with um, Miko at the park. I was doing some training and this lady pulled up with a car, it pulled up in her car, let her dog out of the boot and I was doing some training with Miko and she actually got one of those, put a ball in one of those big ball flingers and um, threw the ball right past me and Miko while we were training. So her dog come tearing out off leash, didn't even go to the ball, just come flying up to me and Miko and, and our whole training session just got blown to bits. I actually just picked Miko up, had a talk to the lady and just sort of moved on, you know. Um, so, yeah, and it, it's just difficult. It's just difficult, but um, and, and it's a lot of these things. It's just a matter of working with it, doing the best you can, um, sticking to the program, and just your pup or dog will get better and better as they get older, you know. Um, Matthew. Yeah, what's he saying? He's saying, um, this should not start a race or a competition. We should let our pups steadily take their time through the program. But I'm interested in people who have followed the big game indicating dog program, or I guess meaning the deer dog training blueprint. How long from the first day you started training until the first day you took your dog hunting? Um, and Stephen said, Stephen White said six months, but I had the odd issue to fix afterwards. And ended up staying on the long line for two years. Um, Luke saying started training at eight weeks and first proper hunt at nine months. Um, I didn't start hunting print till he was almost 15 months old, you know. Um, we got a little bit behind as we were working through the blueprint. And your dog, if you do it to the, you know, to the day, your dog should be, um, you get your pup at eight weeks old and follow the 10 monthly parts of the blueprint. Um, theoretically your pup would be a year old when you start hunting it but there's no issue in going um, you know a couple of months either way either side of that you know and, and like he says it shouldn't be a race it really shouldn't be and, and there's really not much to be gained by trying to hunt a pup or dog early and there's generally a, a more to be gained by slowing down spending more time training and just taking your time letting your dog um, age and mature and taking it like that so um and that's our last question so anyway i hope that was a decent q and a i hope i didn't um hope it flowed all right it's we haven't done one for a while um had a bit of a break so uh from here i'm going to put another post up straight away um put your questions for the next q a here and everyone can do that and i'll make it the pinned post on the big game indicating dogs in a circle and you can ask your questions and we'll try to do these q a's more regularly uh, maybe make them a little bit shorter done more regularly so anyway guys that's me i'm going to shoot off um thanks everyone for the questions Thanks everyone who signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint lately and the Palmico Dog Guide and who's supporting us on social media and with everything we do. We've got a lot coming up this year. Um, thank you. We'll see you later.